Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Apex for Admins, Beyond the Basics. So I'm here. Um, my name is Leanne Templeman. I'm joined by David Liu, and we're really excited for the final installment of Apex for Admins uh, three-part series. Before we get started, uh, this wouldn't be a Salesforce presentation without the Safe Harbor slide. So please make all purchasing decisions for Salesforce uh, based on currently available technologies and currently available features. Um, any forward-looking statements that we make or that happen during the series of this webinar should not factor into any purchasing decisions that you or your companies make. So as I said, my name is Leanne Templeman. I'm a developer evangelist at Salesforce. And I'm joined by David Liu. David is an amazing Salesforce resume. Um, he's a technical architect at Google. He is a Salesforce MVP, a very valuable Salesforce MVP. And he's the creator of SFDC99.com. David, would you like to say hi? Hello, everyone. Guys, it's great to be here today. Um, if you've made it this far, it means you guys have absolutely no fear about coding. So I just want to say I'm really proud of everyone here. Um, don't forget, after today, you know, take a look at the code, write some code, and, and reward yourself. You know, go out and buy a milkshake or something like that. Or, or maybe a hamburger. A hamburger, oh, <laughs> Which call. we'll see why we did that. <laughs> so as, before we get started, um, we love talking to our community. And uh, this is a great place to talk to other Salesforce developers, talk to other admins who code. Um, follow Salesforce devs, that's where you'll get all the notifications around kind of what's going on in the dev community, upcoming webinars, uh, just you know, any news, any blogs, it's awesome. But specifically for this webinar, we love hearing from you at hashtag Apex for Admins, especially those of you who are joining the recording. Um, even though you couldn't ask live questions today during the live webinar, reach out to us at Apex for Admins. Um, David and I are both on Twitter and our fellow developers are all on Twitter. And it's a great place to share your stories about, you know, the first triggers you're writing and successes that you're having. And we, we love hearing that. So um, talk to us at Apex for Admins. And like I said, this webinar will be recorded. So if for any reason you do have to drop off, um, this will be recorded. It will be posted to the registration page and the YouTube page as well. So if you do have questions throughout the course of this webinar, there is a chat window on the go to, uh, go to webinar panel, and we have a team of experts here uh, ready to answer those questions. So if you have questions, whether it's about David's path or something that we're talking about, or if it's an Apex question, um, ask that on the go to webinar chat. We're going to try really hard and try our best to get to all the questions, and we're going to pick a few to touch on at the end for live Q&A. If we don't get to your question, we're going to try to to get to that after the webinar, or again, reach out to us at Apex for Admins, or go to the developer forum. So developer.salesforce.com slash forums is a great place to um, reach out to other developers, people who are learning to develop, um, do code share, share your code, and see maybe why something's not working the way you expect it to work. And some of our most rock star developers are super active on the developer forums. David, how many posts do you have on the developer forums? 4,000 posts, baby. Awesome. And so I mentioned that David was the creator of sfdc99.com. Um, sfdc99.com is it's amazing. I can't say enough good things about David's site. I've been at Salesforce for five years, and this is where I'm learning to code on Salesforce. Um, this is a phenomenal uh, learner's path for people with a admin skill set uh, who are you know, rock star admins, workflow wizards, know how to do all this stuff in the declarative platform, and want to learn to write triggers and kind of extend their skills even further and become an admin who codes. And so we're talking quite uh, through a lot of the content that David's created, but this is uh, an amazing website. I mean, David's website is, is just insane. Um, Thank you. The code that David's running today, it's going to be posted on this website. So um, when we do the code exercises, just follow along with what David's doing, um, and then afterwards, absolutely go and you know cut and paste the code. And he actually has an org here available for you as well if you'd like to log into his org and kind of go through some of the, the, the code and the test classes and triggers that he's writing. But it'll all be posted here um, for you to play with afterwards. 
And also don't miss out on Dreamforce. So we talked quite a bit, especially in the first webinar, about the ways to become an admin who codes and how to continue on your learning path. And we're going to talk about that today as well. Um, and I, you know, anyone who's been to Dreamforce, regardless of where you are in your sales first learning path, um, whether you're starting out as an admin, whether you're learning to code, whether you're a programmer and you're switching over to the Salesforce platform or you're learning the Salesforce platform, um, there's a track for you at Dreamforce. There's there's a session for you at Dreamforce. There's people for you to talk to at Dreamforce. There's workbooks for you at Dreamforce. So we really want to see you at Dreamforce. And actually, David is speaking this year at Dreamforce. So yep. if you want to you know, find David, go to his session, tell him how much you, you love his website <laughs> and how he taught you how to code. That's a great place to find him because yep. he'll be speaking this year. Hope to meet some of you guys there. Yeah, we do have a discount code. This deck will be posted. Um, we do have a discount code for our audience today as well. So what are we talking about today? We're going to touch on what we learned last week. We should be, you know, ideally everyone who's joining should have some familiarity with what we've talked about the past two weeks, but if you haven't, stay on the line. There's a lot to learn, um, but I definitely encourage going back and listening to the recordings from the last two, week if, two weeks if possible, because we will be referencing today some of the core elements around Apex that came up in the last two weeks. So we will be referencing Stockel, we will be referencing some Apex variables, things that we covered last week especially. Um, so definitely, if you if you're this is the first time you're tuning into the uh, Apex for Admin series, that's awesome. We're really excited to have you here. But after today's webinar, we would really encourage you to go back and listen to the recordings. So today, David's going to cover lists and dot notation, and we're also going to talk about the promised land of combining Stockel yes. and Apex. So um, we're really excited. We talked about this quite a bit last week. Um, all the things that we can do to kind of further our flexibility and how nimble we can be using uh, APAC and Salesforce once we bring Sockle in, that it allows us to really expand beyond, uh, you know, the fields that are typically available to us in workflow. So we're going to actually go through and do that today and see what that looks like. And we're going to write our own deduping trigger. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. It's going to be great. It's going to be really fun. And for the deduping trigger, we're going to talk about a good test class. So you'll remember in episode one, um, we did touch on what test classes are and why we have them. Now that we're at the point where we're writing production-ready code and we're writing code that we'd like to actually use in our production org, we need to know the core elements of a good test class. So David's going to cover that as well. And we're going to talk at the end today about becoming an admin who codes. So um, we're really, really excited um, the, the response that this webinar has gotten and how many people have come every single week. And I mean, it's so fun to see you know, all the activity on the chat and everyone answering the questions and, and writing these amazing triggers and being like lightning with answering the quiz questions. It's awesome. And so we're going to talk about kind of what to do next because we want to make sure that we're, we're uh, providing, you know, the right amount of information. So I did mention tuning in for last week's uh, Apex for Admins. The the uh, second recording will be posted here, Apex for Admins, Build on the Basics. So again, if you haven't had a chance to, to listen to last week's, um, it will be posted here. And it's a, great, uh, it's a great webinar to listen to, to have all three as they do build on each other. So if you are joining today and you didn't, um, didn't make last week's, that's a great, uh, great one to listen to, to kind of bring you up to speed. So what did we talk about last week? We walked through, David walked us through the different types of Stockel queries and why we use Stockel. So we talked about using Stockel to be able to pull any record in our database. So it's incredibly powerful. It allows us to look for or get any record um, in our database, which is huge. And that's where we get so much flexibility and, and we're so nimble with our triggers. Um, so this is our Stockel query you may remember from the challenge last week. And so we're combining here a few different types of queries that, that David taught us last week. We have, for the Hershey, we have the fuzzy matching. Mm -hmm. um, we're combining some uh, Boolean. Mm -hmm. We also have our and or as well. So we have a number of different queries combining here. And, and we did have some winners last week. The answer to this one was uh, Reese's Pieces. Great job, everyone. And so or it was Reese's. <laughs> But uh, so this is kind of the, the high level of what we covered last week, the, the final. And again, if you didn't join last week, 
Um, I believe it's chapter three on SFDC 99 is where we cover SQL queries on David's site. We also talked about trigger variables. So how do we use trigger variables to return the answer or the information that we'd like? Um, we talked about string, Boolean, integer. So we, we use these different trigger variables to actually evaluate a um, if statement mm -hmm. for what the answer was to how much did David spend on frozen merchandise. Yep, and the answer was seven ninety nine. This was our second challenge last week, and actually a lot of people got this one wrong, um, and and that's because we wrote it to be intentionally misleading. But uh, the way to look at this, um, I think a lot of people wanted to add up seven ninety nine plus twelve ninety nine plus two hundred to get the answer. Um, but know that when you're using if statements, it's if, and then it's else if, right? It's not also if, it's else if. So that's why uh, the answer for this one was just $7.99. Uh, we only caught the first clause. So time for a pop quiz. We'll see if everyone remembers, uh, remembers what we learned last week. So what type of variable would you need to store this information? My contact, count owner ID. And what Write a query that gets, actually we'll go through that first answer. So the answer to that is string. And I see a lot of correct answers. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Everyone was super fast with their, with their answers there. Yep, yep. It's a string. Remember, it's text because IDs have uh, text and number sometimes. So we want to use string, which can handle both. So we talked about writing those SQL queries to get any information, any records from our database. Write a query that gets all opportunities with a close date in the future. Awesome. You guys are very fast typers. You type out that entire query so quickly. That's great. A lot of correct answers. Nice job, guys. So we're going to take the ID. We're going to select ID from all opportunities where the close date is greater than today. What kind of data type is this value? Ooh, everyone's getting this one right. Nice. Boolean. Perfect. Great job. Great job, everyone. So, David, what can you tell us about lists? Why are lists important? All right. It's time for code, guys. It's time for the best part of your day. Let's code. Um, so lists, Leon, are very important because almost every trigger you write is going to have a list. And the reason this is so is because uh, every trigger you write is going to have SQL, and the output of SQL is always a list. Now, the formal definition of a list is it's an ordered collection of records that all share the same type. And by type, I mean the apex data types, right? Strings, uh, integers, decimals, uh, dates, even custom objects, standard objects, uh, those ones. Now, what else is also an ordered collection of records that share the same type? Trigger.new. If you guys remember, trigger.new, we talked about these in the first and second webinar. It's a list of every record that's entering your trigger. Now, let's take a look at the code here what we're trying to do. Um, so what we're doing is we're creating a new list variable, we're calling it the dollar menu, and the type of this list is food. And we're putting food inside those, those, carrot, those carrots to say this list, uh, every record inside it is going to be of type food. Now the SQL query we have on the right is querying from the food object, of course. And we're only finding food that has uh, a price of one. This is our dollar menu, guys. Now, looking at the lines below, what we're doing is we're accessing members of this list using a bracket notation, and we're setting it to variables. So in the first one, we're doing dollar menu bracket zero, and we're setting that to a, a first item variable. Then to get the second item, we're doing dollar menu bracket one. Notice that the counting begins at zero. So if you want the first record, uh, you do bracket zero. Now, why, why does code do this? Not just Apex, but all programming languages do this. You know, I looked it up on Google, and there's not really a satisfying answer to that. 
It's just the way it is. So just remember, start at zero. All right, on the bottom half, uh, we're, we're creating a new list from scratch. So you don't always have to use Sockwool uh, to create a list. Here we're creating one from scratch, and we're adding uh, some of our buddies to it, some of the uh, hamburger gang at McDonald's. Um, but I hear some of those guys are actually getting phased out for Mayor McCheese. All right, next, let's talk about dot notation. All right, dot notation really has a special place in my heart um, because I still remember the exact moment I fell in love with coding. I remember you know, where I was, what I was doing, and I was learning dot notation. It ranks up there you know, for me you know, with, the, with the best moments of my life, you know, my first kiss, uh, the first time I ate macaroni and cheese, you know, the first time I learned dot notation. So that is really important. So there are three times you're going to, three, three different use cases of using dot notation. Uh, two of them you should be familiar with. So the first one is you use dot notation to access fields, right? Whether you are getting fields or setting fields, here we are accessing the first uh, record in our dollar menu and we're accessing the name of it using dot notation. Now the second use case is to traverse relationships. Um, on our food on our food object uh, we might have a lookup field, a eaten by field uh, that looks up to a user. And so we're using dot notation to go to that lookup field and then access the name of that user who is eating uh, this dollar menu item. Notice that we use double underscore R instead of double underscore C here. Uh, whenever you have custom relationships, you use double underscore R when traversing, and you use double underscore C only if you want the ID. Third use case, and this one should be brand new to you. Um, you use dot notation to access methods. Um, so every uh, data type in Apex, for example, strings and lists and integers, they all have methods. Now what this method does, we're using dot remove, it will remove the, the, the record in the second position of our list. Now remember, uh, position, the counting starts at zero. So if we're removing the second one, we're, re we're really removing the third one. And in this case, uh, you know, if you go to McDonald's as often as I do, you know that the McDouble is no longer part of the dollar menu. And it's actually getting replaced by this barbecue ranch burger on the bottom, which, which I refuse to eat, um, I refuse to even capitalize it, but we're using dot notation, a string method called capitalize, uh, to, to make that B in barbecue ranch burger, burger capital. All right, moving on. So everything you've learned so far in webinar one and webinar two and, and webinar three right now, it's all really building up to this one moment. Right, we are we're reaching what is you know apex trigger nirvana. We're coding, we're we're combining uh, SQL queries and apex triggers to do you know amazing things. We're going to write this deduping trigger. And the reason why this is coding nirvana is with SQL, you know now everything in your entire database is available to you. You just have to query it, right? You, you can do absolutely anything you want. You know how to update records. You know how to create new records. You can, we can do anything right now. Um, but, you know, whereas with a workflow, you'd only have access to the current record and maybe the parent record of it. But now we can do absolutely anything. So we are about to become Salesforce gods. But before we do that, <laughs> you have to learn about bind variables. So bind variables let us use Apex variables inside SQL queries. It's actually very simple. Um, the only thing you have to remember is that when you're using an Apex variable in a SQL query, you have to precede the variable by a colon. So here we're creating a new variable. It's a string. Uh, it's, it's, it's the best thing you can buy at McDonald's. If you don't have this at your McDonald's, I suggest you move. Um, chocolate dipped ice cream cones, and we are including that variable in our SQL query using a colon. Now on the second half, you can also use lists as bind variables. So we can filter our SQL query using lists. So we're creating a new list, uh, we're adding diet foods to it, 
and then we're doing a software query for only uh, food items that have a name that is in our list. Notice here we are using a special keyword in software called in. Instead of equals, we're using in because we're using a list. So all food in uh, our diet food list. Remember, there is a colon. Uh oh. Uh oh, time for a challenge. Everyone, get your get your typing fingers ready. Um, so we have a challenge, just like last week. We are really excited to send not only a Salesforce developer T-shirt to start your your developer T-shirt collection, but also a copy of David's favorite book in the world, yep. Head First Java. Yep. So the uh, question is, which of these movies is overrated? Which of these movies is overrated? So here we go. We're going to show the code on the next slide. Give you guys a hint. It's not frozen. <laughs> so first, first answer is get a prize pack. Ooh. Oh, here we have one we person. We have one. Sally Song. Well done, Sally. We might only be giving one prize pack today. Wow, a lot of people. This one is all over the place. There we go. Elizabeth Haney. Nice, nice. Nice job. Okay, we're looking for one more. One more, guys. It's still up in the air. Bam. Gabriel Roll. Nice. Congratulations, guys. So I'm going to show the answer. Answer is Harry Potter. So why is it Harry Potter? And, and by the way, if the question is which Harry Potter, the answer is all of them. Um, so why Harry Potter? Well, let's see. So we're creating a new list of strings, and then we're adding uh, 10 movies to it. Now, it's adding it from left to right. You know, It goes Frozen and Hunger Games, then The Matrix and Titanic. So we're adding all 10 of them. Then afterwards, we are removing one of the movies in position two. Um, so position two really means the third movie. So in this case, that's The Matrix, because The Matrix is an awesome movie. Uh, it should not be in consideration uh, for this challenge. Then uh, we're creating a new position variable. So this position variable, we're getting the size of our list, which is which used to be 10, now it's 9 since we removed 1, and then we're subtracting 5. So 9 minus 5, the position is 4. Right? So the overrated movie we have is in the fourth position of our movie list, which means uh, it is the fifth item of our list. If you start counting, we've got Frozen, Hunger Games, Skip the Matrix, Titanic, Star Wars, Harry Potter. Harry Potter is our movie, and congratulations everyone who got that one right. Awesome. Great job, guys. So next up, let's talk about how to write. You know, we promised that we were going to write our, our final deduping trigger. So let's imagine we're collecting our business requirements. So I'm an admin. I have the, the need of preventing my users from creating duplicate contacts. I'm sure no one on the phone has ever encountered that before. Um, but I'd like to prevent my, my end users from creating leads that are the same as existing contacts. So I'm going to collect my business requirements before we get started on the trigger. So when do I want it to evaluate? I'd like this to evaluate whenever a lead is created or updated. I'd like it to only evaluate leads with an email address. So we're going to use email address as our unique identifier here to determine if it is in fact a duplicate or not. So the lead must have a must have an email address in order to to be evaluated and I'd like the trigger to search for contacts matching contacts based on that email address so I'd like it uh, the trigger to look for or to get um, all contacts that have that same email address now I've added a field to my lead record and I've added a lookup field to contacts to my lead record and that field is called dupe contact. So if a match is found, the action that I would like to happen is I'd like it to populate a, a contact in that dupe contact lookup field.
Now, if the match is not found, I'd like to have no value there. I'd like to clear the value of dupe contact um, of that lookup field. So this is going to look, for those of you especially who've written like workflow rules before, this, the, the idea of kind of sitting down and, and writing out your requirements is, um, is the place to, it's, it's similar to, uh, to putting those requirements down for our workflow world, but we're doing that for our trigger. So I have my business requirements and I'm ready to get coding. So let's go ahead and write a deduping trigger. All right. So read all the comments from the last webinar. And you guys seem to like it when we code live. You guys like the danger. I like to live dangerously too. So let's write our trigger. Going to leads, going to triggers, and hit new. All right, here we go. Here's our boilerplate code. But first, let's add some comments. What are we trying to do? Um, look for duplicate contacts based on email. And if we find a duplicate contact, populate a field with the contact. Populate a lookup field. Perfect. Here's our boilerplate code. Let's add a name to this. We'll call it detect dupes. We can name it anything we want. And we want this trigger to run before a lead is inserted or before a lead is updated. Um, now, if you remember our previous triggers, we used after insert. Um, now we're using uh, before insert and before update. What's the difference between before and after? Well, it's a long conversation, but the short answer is um, before runs this trigger right before a record is saved, whereas after runs this trigger right after the record is saved. Uh, why you'd want to use after is because some fields are only updated after record is saved. For example, um, you know, a lead wouldn't have an ID until right after the lead is created. In this case, we don't have to worry about that, so we're going to use before. You know, if you're ever on the fence about which one to use, most of the time you're going to use before, probably 90% of the time. Uh, but don't worry about that if you didn't understand it. It's, it's not that important right now. So if you remember, all triggers have this loop. So we're looping across all leads inside our trigger. Then the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure um, our lead has an email. Let's write a comment for that. Make sure our lead has an email address. So we're going to say if l.email does not equal to null, then we want to run some code. And now what we want to do next is, okay, we have a lead, it's in our trigger, um, the email is not null, now let's search for a contact based off that lead email. So I'm going to create a variable, lead email, I'm going to sell it, set it to l.email. And now we are going to mix SQL and Apex to create this trigger that many companies would pay good money for, by the way. List contact dupe contacts. So we're creating a new list variable of contacts. We're calling it dupe contacts. Select ID from contact. Now we're going to use our lead email variable inside this SQL query where email equals, remember the colon before all variables, lead email. Bam. So we're doing a query on contacts for all contacts that have a matching email address to the lead. So here we are. Find a dupe. Now, if a dupe is found, update a field. So we're going to write an if statement. If dupe contacts dot size greater than zero. So this is dot notation. We're using uh, a size method which tells us how many contacts are in our list. So if we have found duplicates, there's going to be at least one contact in our list. What we do is l dot our lead dot dupe contact field. We're going to set it to the ID of our dupe contact. Here in this bracket, we're getting the first dupe that we find. There can be many dupes 
Well, we only really need one, so we're going to do this. And so we're setting this dupe contact lookup field uh, to the ID of our dupe contact. Now, if we don't find one, and else. So if the size of our dupe contacts is zero, which means none were found, we're going to clear out the value of this field. We're going to set it to null. And we're going to do the same thing if the lead doesn't have an email address. That's really all there is to this trigger. Let's save it and see what happens. Oh my gosh, no error. It's a miracle. All right, sweet. Now let's test to see if this works. So we'll create a new contact, we'll give it an email address, and then we'll create a lead with the exact same email address and see what happens. Let's copy this. So we create a new contact with that email address. Let's create a new lead. Same email address. Here's our dupe contact lookup field. If everything works, when I hit save, our dupe contact will be populated here. Whew. Here we go. Right here. Spider-Man, here's our contact, and it's identified on this lead. Now, you might be thinking, you know, why did we let this lead be created? You know, why don't... Why don't we just prevent the lead from being created? This is where your admin powers really come in handy. Remember, we said embrace your admin side. So what we could do um, is you could create a validation rule that says if the dupe contact field on this lead is not empty, you know, write an error on the email field saying uh, email address already being used by contact. Now, why would we want to do it this way without doing it with code? Well, it's always easier to change validation rule than it is to write code. Right? If we if we had to code this stuff in our trigger, you know, we'd have to account for it in our test class. Uh, maybe there'd be certain scenarios where we want to allow dupes and certain scenarios where we don't want to allow dupes. Um, it would it, it would be really tough to do that in a trigger, but it's very very easy to do in a validation rule. Awesome. Thank you, David. That's perfect. That's exactly what I needed. Um, thank you. That's very useful, right? So time for another pop quiz. Without SQL, what fields are available for each record entering a trigger? So we talked, we talked quite a bit about kind of what we can do with SQL. So we talked about this um, tangentially because we said, you know, here's all the things we can do in SQL, but if we're not using SQL, how are we limited? Nice. Awesome. Great Lots job, of correct guys. answers. Only the fields directly on the record are available, so related fields are not. So that's why we're using SQL um, in, you know, a huge majority of our triggers, and because it allows us that flexibility to query any record in our database. Whereas if you're not using SQL in your trigger, it's very likely that you may want to uh, look at workflow rules to accomplish what you're doing. If it's kind of a, a basic field update or actioning a field on the record on which you are acting. Yep. What character must be placed before every apex variable used in a SQL query? So David just went through this um, in the in the trigger he just wrote, and the answer correct everyone. I see tons of right answers. Um, that's awesome. A colon. Uh, what are the three uses of dot notation? The three uses. What are the three times? Nice. Awesome. Sophie, you had the first right answer. That's awesome. Good job. Very cool. Tons of right answers. So we use dot notation to access fields, to traverse relationships, and in order to use methods. So we touched on test classes in webinar one, and we talked about kind of why, why we should care about test classes and, and what a test class is. Um, 
and then we, you know, we've talked quite a bit about creating triggers. And now that we've created a trigger that we're ready to deploy in production, it's really important that we talk about the principles of a good test class. Mm -hmm. How do we create a solid and a, a good, a, a sound test class? Um, and David's going to talk about the, the four core principles, which are creating records from scratch, being assertive, breaking things, and being bulky. Mm -hmm. The first principle is we want to create all our records from scratch. And usually in a test class, this is the very first thing you're going to do. And there's really two good reasons uh, why we should create our records from scratch. First off, if we queried existing records in our database using SQL, um, it would be unreliable because our database changes all the time, right? Uh, maybe, maybe sometimes our SQL query would have zero results and sometimes it would be 100. Um, it's too much variation. We want to keep it very predictable. The second reason is because you have to create your records from scratch. In every test class, um, it doesn't have, it, it by default doesn't have access to other records in your database. You have to create everything, otherwise you're testing on a totally empty database. So what we're doing here is we're doing something very similar to what we did with point and click when we were trying to see if our trigger worked. Right? When we, first we created a new duplicate contact, then we created a lead with the exact same email address and we inserted a lead and we saw what happened. Now the second thing we want to do is we want to use a method called system.assert equals. This is probably my favorite method in all of Apex. Now what this method is, is it accepts two inputs. And this method makes sure to see that the two inputs are equal. Right? In the first example, uh, the two inputs are equal so everything runs fine. But if you look at the second example, when the two inputs are not equal, uh, what system.assert equals will do is it'll give you an error. It'll stop your test class immediately and it'll give you an error. In this case, it's going to say, uh, you know, Peyton Manning is the best active quarterback. Uh, it's not Tom Brady. Now, on the bottom, we're doing, uh, we're, we're going back, we're going back to testing our actual trigger that we wrote. So here, we're doing a SQL query to get the latest values of the lead that we just entered, this dupe lead. And we expected the dupe contact field on the lead uh, to be populated with the ID of the contact dupe that we inserted. Right? This is exactly the same as what we were checking with point and click uh, when we were testing out our trigger. So now we're doing system.assert equals to make sure that the ID of the contact is exactly the same as the dupe contact value on our lead. In this case, we expect it to be true, and we expect our test class to continue to run. Now, the third one. This one is one that people miss often. Um, basically, in every test class, we want to test things that shouldn't work, right? We want to kind of try to break your trigger. This is like this is like in math, dividing by zero, right? You you want to break things, and so our trigger is meant to run um, and find a dupe if the two email addresses are exactly the same. But what happens if we insert a lead and it has a totally unique email address? This is what we want to test in our test class to make sure everything works. So we insert a new lead, we give it a totally unique email address, and we expect no dupes to be found. So at the bottom, we're querying the latest values of dupe contact of that field on the lead, and we're making sure it's equal to null because no dupes are found. Now the fourth principle um, is, is a little foreshadowing to what you're going to learn next after this webinar series is you want to do everything in bulk in Apex. Um, the, sort of the next step is to learn how to scale your triggers and your test classes and generally the way to do this is you want to do everything in multiples of 200. Right, you want to insert 200 contacts at once, insert 200 leads at once, for example. And this is what we're doing right now. Don't worry too much about this. Uh, just keep it in mind. But what we're doing is we're doing a for loop, um, and we're iterating across it 200 times. And for each of those iterations, we're creating a new contact. And then finally, at the end, we're going to insert all those contacts at the same time. Oh, man. Time for another challenge. So based on what we just learned, 
about the core principles of a successful test class or a good test class. Um, we're going to look at a test class, a block of code, and we're going to, or the, the, the question is, which testing principle is this class missing? Mm -hmm. So the first listener to guess via the chat window um, will win a developer prize package. So which testing principle is this class missing? No answers yet. So other than testing in bulk. Other than testing in bulk. Bam, awesome. We got Sean one. Zedner, you are correct. Let's see. Here's another one. Brian Lavin, you are also correct. And Benjamin Massenberg. Awesome. So we wanted to look at outside, other than testing in bulk, which this is doing, which testing principle is this class missing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so David talked about testing things that should not work, negative testing. Exactly. So we have a trigger. If you read the comments up top, we have a trigger that calculates the price of this record uh, based off of the number of grams of fat in the burger. Um, so what we're doing in this test class is you see the first thing we're doing is we're creating records from scratch. So that solves principle number one. The second thing we're doing is we're using system.assert equals to make sure the price is what we expect, which is 30 times 0.49, which is $14.70. Um, and that's our principle number two. But principle number three, test things that shouldn't work. This doesn't really do that. So how would we break our trigger that calculates the price based off the grams of fat? Well, what you would do is, um, what if the grams of fat is zero? Or what if uh, the, the grams of fat field is null? Right? Then we would be multiplying 49 by zero, and then obviously we cannot sell these, this quadruple cheeseburger for free. So, so always remember in every test class you do, um, always do negative tests. If you ever take the advanced developer certification or you're, you're ever in an interview for uh, developer positions, uh, this is something that's tested very often. So let's go through and actually write a test class for our GDBing trigger. Let's switch back over into our org, and David's going to actually walk us through. And again, all of this code is going to be on sfdc99.com. Yep, you can go there right now. It'll be the second post, and you can follow along. So we're going to write a test class for our trigger, and we're going to follow the three main principles. Now, the first thing I'm actually going to do is I'm going to copy an older, the code from an older test class. The reason I'm going to do this is there's a bunch of boilerplate code that I don't really want to type out and I don't really know how to type out. There's a joke in programming. It's that um, you know, there's only one, one program that was ever written that was totally unique. All of the code after that was copying it, and that's totally true. So we're copying an old test class. We're going to give it a custom name, test super, test dupes. So what do we want to do in our test class? Well, we want to follow our three principles. First principle, create records from scratch. So to test this, we want to create a new contact from scratch. We're going to fill out the standard fields on this contact. Fill out the email address. Then we're going to insert the contact. Next, we need a dupe lead that has the exact same email address. Set all the standard required fields here. And then we're going to make sure that this lead has the exact same email address as our contact. There is a company name. Yep. 
this guy should really be more careful with who he gives his email address to. Awesome. So we're creating our records from scratch, and we've created our two dupes. Now we have to follow principle number two, which is use system.assert equals. So to get the latest values of our dupe lead, we're going to do a SQL query. So right after this line here, line 15, our trigger is going to run, and it's going to populate that dupe contact field. Now we just want to get the latest values of it. So we're going to do this. From lead limit 1. Now I told you earlier that the output of every SQL query is a list. In this case, we're just setting it to a lead right here. And we can do that because there's only going to be one record returned from this SQL query because we're limiting, limiting it to one. In fact, there is only one lead in our database right now since test classes run on totally clean databases. Now we want to assert that the two values are equal. The dupe contact ID and the dupe contact field on our lead. Just like this. So we've inserted a contact, we've inserted a dupe lead, um, and now we've checked that uh, the dupe contact field is populated correctly on our lead as expected. But now we got to follow principle number three. We want to test things that shouldn't work. So um, what if we created a lead that has a unique email address? So let's set the email address of our dupe lead to, there we go. Now he enters his right email address. We're going to update it. So since our trigger runs on insert and update, after this line, it's going to update the dupe contact field on our lead. And it should clear it. So now let's do a SQL query to get all the latest values from this record. Same SQL query as above. The search is a little bit different. So we, we want to make sure that uh, no dupes were found when this lead was updated because it has a unique email address. So we want to make sure it's equal to null. The dupe contact lookup is null. And that's all there is to it. Let's save it. Oh, no errors again. Nice. Now let's run this test class to see what happens. Uh, we're going to get a red X if it didn't work, if our assertions failed. And we're going to get a green check if all our assertions came out to true. Sweet. Everything came out to true, which means everything we asserted was true. Because if it was false, it would have canceled our test class immediately. Let's go to our trigger and see. Here we go. We have code coverage. We have over 75%, which means we can actually deploy this code to our org today. So we just wrote an awesome trigger that dedupes records for you. This is a trigger that many companies would pay a lot of money for, and we did it after basically just three hours of coding. Uh, congrats, guys. Uh, really proud of you guys. Thank you for following along. Awesome. So just so we know, when you say it's got over over 75%, mm -hmm. and that means mm -hmm. we can deploy it to production. Mm -hmm. So if it didn't have 75%, then that's something we cannot. So if we're working on this in our sandbox or developer edition environment, we'd have to go back and fix the errors and then, and then try to redeploy. Exactly, exactly. 75% okay. is required to deploy code. Salesforce just wants to make sure that you're creating good tests. By the way, the line that's not covered is when, uh, is if you see line seven, we're checking if the lead email is not equal to null. Uh, what we want to do in our test class is we want to create a lead with an empty email address. And that would give us our final line of code coverage. So time for our pop quiz based on what we just learned about test classes. Why shouldn't a dev query for production records in a test class? Why do you not want to query for production records in a test class? 
Nice, nice. Great answers. Because your test code runs out any existing data from your sandbox and production database. There's a ton of correct answers here in the chat. That's awesome. Um, and one of our principles is that you should always create records from scratch. Otherwise, down the line, you can have future, uh, future test failures. Why should every test class use system assert equals, even if your code works 100% of the time? This one's a tough one. Why do we use system assert equals, even if our code works? It's a really tough one. So in the future, as your org changes, your code may break. So if you had a new validation rule, for example, um, and so as you change, like make metadata changes using, mm -hmm. for example, the declarative platform as you're, you're building in your org, um, a validation rule could actually prevent one of the triggers from updating records. So system is sort of equal, will update you to those future changes. So even if you don't have that today, as we all know, our orgs are not static, right? Our metadata changes, we, we build, we use, we use new functionality, we build new workflow rules and validation rules. So, so we want to ensure that we're always um, putting system assert equals in there so that we, we hear about it before it just doesn't work. So let's talk about what's next. We covered a lot of material today, um, but what's next in kind of our learning path? I know for me, I'm working on kind of my continued learning path on APEX and, and what I should learn next. Um, we talked a little bit today about deployment. So David mentioned, you know, of course, we went in depth into test classes, and then Dave mentioned, you know, your test code coverage and, and what your coverage has to be in order to deploy to production. Um, those of you who are using Sandbox, change sets is a phenomenal feature to use for this purpose um, in order to, once you are building code that you'd like to deploy in production, you can build that in your Sandbox if you have access to Sandboxes. Uh, on your, you know, based on your existing metadata, your existing custom fields and relationships, and deploy that. And you can also deploy back and forth. So with chain sets, you can deploy any connected org. So for example, if you did deploy something from Sandbox to production, and then later you wanted to make modifications to that, you could actually deploy it back from production to Sandbox, make those changes, and then redeploy it. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to go back and forth in between those connected orgs. So change sets, if you're not familiar with change sets, um, there's a there's a large section of it in help and training. I recommend reading up on it. It's in the data management section of your, your force.com setup area on your org. We're also going to talk about Visual Force. So I know I'm really excited to start learning Visual Force and how to use Visual Force in my Salesforce org. And we're really hard at work um, our, on our dev team here at Salesforce to put together a upcoming webinar around Visual Force. So dates are TBD. It'll be sometime in the next few months. Um, but you know, it's going to be for you. So I'm really excited to put together or work on a Visual Force for admins. So stay tuned for that. Um, we'll definitely be sending you know the, the email for that out to everyone who's registered for this webinar series. And it'll also be on uh, on Twitter and also be on uh, developer at salesforce.com. But that's kind of what's one of the things that's next for me on my learning list. And um, so we're, we're excited to present that eventually. And so that'll be upcoming. And, you know, David mentioned bulkifying. So get bulky was one of our principles. Yep, yep. And bulkifying is really the next most logical thing for you to learn in your Apex uh, journey. Um, you want to make sure that you're writing triggers that scale even if, you know, thousands of records are being updated in your org at the same time, for example, through data loader. Because Salesforce has something called governor limits, which is going to prevent you from doing certain things too many times. For example, you can't have too many software queries running in a single trigger. Um, but you guys will learn about that one soon. Next is object-oriented thinking. So coding in such a way that is object-oriented will help you scale your code, and it will really help you organize your code so that it's really reusable and changeable in the future. Um, we didn't touch on that because it's an advanced topic, but when you're reading Head First Java, it's probably the best book out there that's going to teach you how to think in an object-oriented way. And you already have practice doing it in your Salesforce org uh, when you're creating custom objects, when you're making that decision, like, 
should I create new fields or should I create a new custom object? It's a similar way of thinking, but in the world of code. And also there's, you know, we talk about the learning path on SFDC 99. Um, we covered in this three-part webinar series a lot of the information in chapters one, two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. I do recommend going through chapters one, two, three, and four just um, to kind of reiterate some, con some concepts. There's a lot of material, so there's certain areas that we didn't cover in depth, which David does cover in depth on his website. So I would recommend first off going through chapters one through four and doing the quizzes. So we had you know a few questions of quizzes here and a few quiz questions here, which everyone did really phenomenal on. But going through, David has much more in-depth quizzes involving code and involving, um, you know, really getting in-depth on those concepts. So going through chapters one through four, and then also up next, chapter five and chapter six. So these are the next chapters on sfdc99.com under the beginner tutorials tab. And like he just said, uh, going through bulkifying and governor limits and understanding why we should care about those, why they're important, and how to bulkify our code. And also getting deeper with advanced Apex concepts. So, um, you know, we built our Apex trigger today using SQL, and we built our gduping trigger and our test class. But getting even further um, with our with our code and building more complex triggers and, and adding more tools to our toolbox. Yep. And after you get done with chapter five, six, and seven, you're honestly going to know almost as much as code as much code as I do. So you're going to learn a lot, guys. Awesome. So. We covered a lot of concepts today. We talked about list and dot notation. We wrote our GDPing trigger. Again, that code can be found at sfdc99.com. And we wrote that code by combining SQL and Apex. And then we were able to deploy that because we wrote a, a good test class, a, a, a solid test class, and that allowed us to deploy it to production. And we are going to talk a little bit about, we talked a little bit about becoming an admin who codes. So we're really excited about you know everyone joining this webinar and, you know, whether you have zero programming experience or you're just new to Apex, um, becoming someone with that admin skill set who also can code is just so incredibly powerful. We talked about it a lot in the first webinar, but I mean, if you know everything about the declarative platform and, and you're a, a workflow wizard and you know how to build everything that we have in our point and click world and you can also write triggers, man, you are like unstoppable. Mm -hmm. So we're super excited um, for everyone who's becoming an admin who codes and we really look forward to meeting you at Dreamforce. We look forward to hearing about you know, how you're doing on Twitter or SFTC99 or, or our success uh, community. I'm gonna miss you guys. So, so chat us on Twitter and on the site. Yeah, let us know. And we wanna hear your stories too. You know, Apex, hashtag Apex for admins or just tweet us directly or, or email us. But We've been we've had a few stories so far, you know, people telling us how they are writing their first triggers and and how it's going and and we're really really excited to to kind of hear those stories and, and that's why we're that's why we're here. That's why we've been here the last three weeks. So I know I'm you know so flattered to have David here joining us. He's just like a rock star in the admin who codes world. So we're really lucky to have him here. Honor's mine. <laughs> so again, our resources. Um, you know, reach out to myself or David, developer.salesforce.com slash forms is a great place for uh, beginning developers. There's an entire section on Apex code development. There's good code share going on there. There's questions. It's a great kind of level set for, in place to access um, people like David who are these rockstar developers. Also David's site, which I can't say enough good 